Welcome to the Romance of the Three Kingdoms podcast. This is episode 8. If you're enjoying the podcast so far, help other people discover it. Tell someone you know about the show and direct them to our website, threekingdomspodcast.com, spelled with the number 3. Thanks. So last time on the podcast, Liu Bei, Guan Yu, and Zhang Fei had just triple-teamed Lü Bu and sent him running back into Hu Lao Pass. With the tide of war turning against him, and the coalition breathing down his neck, Dong Zhuo decided to move the capital from Luoyang to Chang'an, which was about 200 miles to the west. So he returned to Luoyang, assembled all the officials at court, and told them, After some 200 years as the eastern capital of the Han, Luoyang has exhausted its royal fortune. In my opinion, the aura of Ru has migrated to Chang'an. I plan to move the court there, so pack your bags. There were bound to be objections to this. Yang Biao, the minister of the interior, spoke up. The region around Chang'an is in ruins. There is no reason to abandon the ancestral temples and imperial tombs here. I am concerned that this move will alarm the people. It is always easier to alarm them, but much more difficult to pacify them. Prime Minister, please reconsider. This move is for the sake of the empire. How dare you oppose it? Dong Zhuo reproached him angrily. But another official, Huang Wan, chimed in. Minister Yang is correct. Back when Wang Mang usurped the throne, a leader of the Red Eyebrows rebels burned Chang'an to the ground, reducing it to nothing more than broken tiles. Also, most of the inhabitants have scattered. It is not right to abandon all the palaces here for a wasteland. Dong Zhuo, however, would not be swayed. The region to the east of the passes is plagued by rebellion, and the empire is in chaos. Chang'an is protected by mountains. Besides, it is near Longyou, where we can easily obtain timber, stone, bricks, and building materials. We would be able to put up palaces in about a month, so stop it with your nonsense. But another official, Xun Shuang, the Minister of Works, still didn't get the message, as he also spoke out against the plan. Prime Minister, if you move the capital, the lives of the common people will be disrupted. Dong Zhuo snapped, I am making plans for the empire. How can I be concerned with a few commoners? That same day, he fired the three officials who had spoken out against the plan and reduced them to commoners. But some people still would not let the matter drop. As Dong Zhuo was getting into his chariot, two officials, chair of the secretariat Zhou Bi and commander of the city gates Wu Qiong, bowed in his direction. Dong Zhuo asked them what they wanted. Zhou Bi said, We've heard that you're making plans to move the capital to Chang'an, so we have come to dissuade you. That was not what Dong Zhuo wanted to hear. I listened to advice from you two before and kept Yuan Shao in office, and now he has rebelled. You two must be in league with him. So Dong Zhuo had his guards take them both outside the city and execute them, and then he issued the order to move to the new capital. The executions had the intended chilling effect, and all the other officials fell into line and prepared to move. But Dong Zhuo had another problem. See, he's not just moving the emperor and the ministers of the court. He also had to move all the people in the capital, because Chang'an was a wasteland at that time, as multiple people had pointed out to Dong Zhuo. And without a whole city's population, there would be no infrastructure to provide for the emperor and the court. So Dong Zhuo had to move the infrastructure, i.e. the capital's residents, with him. Well, imagine moving the entire population of Washington, D.C. to New York, on foot. An undertaking of that magnitude is going to take time, sure, but you would also need a lot of food and money, not just for the trip, but for getting settled in and building palaces once you get to your destination, because, again, there's not much in Chang'an, and Dong Zhuo was kind of short on both money and food at the moment. His advisor Li Ru had a solution. It turns out that the problem wasn't all that difficult once you stop letting yourself be bound by things like morality and basic human decency. Luoyang has many wealthy people, Li Ru told Dong Zhuo. We can seize this wealth by executing anyone linked to Yuan Shao and the rest of the rebels and confiscating their properties. 
Well, given his track record of doing things that tend to make him the common enemy of mankind, Dong Zhuo naturally loved this idea. He ordered 5,000 armored cavalry to ride through the city and round up thousands of wealthy families. They stuck flags on these prisoners' heads that read traitors and rebels, and executed them all outside the city and confiscated their properties. Meanwhile, the less affluent members of the city's residents were no better off. Two of Dong Zhuo's generals, Li Jue and Guo Si, rounded up millions of the city's inhabitants and drove them toward Chang'an. Each group of civilians was followed by a squad of 3,000 soldiers who forced them to keep moving at knife point. Anyone who moved too slowly was killed on the spot. Countless people simply fell over dead from hunger and exhaustion in ditches on the side of the road. And to make things worse, the soldiers plundered food from the civilians and raped the women. The civilians' moans and cries were so loud that they shook the heavens. And no, Dong Zhuo wasn't quite done yet. Before he left Luoyang, he sent out instructions to burn the entire city. Everything from civilian houses to ancestral temples to the royal palaces went up in flames. And just to ensure that he would be a threat to the living and the dead, Dong Zhuo also ordered Li Bu to break open the tombs of dead emperors and their consorts and loot the treasures inside. Well, the soldiers took this as a cue that pretty much nothing was sacred, so they proceeded to loot the tombs of court officials and wealthy civilians. The gold, silver, pearls, silk, and precious ornaments filled more than a thousand carts. With the spoils of the city, as well as the emperor and the rest of the royal household in his possession, Dong Zhuo set off for Chang'an, heading toward one wasteland while leaving another wasteland in his wake. Meanwhile, back at Sishui Pass, seeing that Dong Zhuo had abandoned the capital, Zhao Chen, the lieutenant left to guard the pass, said the heck with this and evacuated. Sun Jian led the vanguard of the coalition through the pass and toward Luoyang. Meanwhile, at Hu Lao Pass, coalition forces led by Liu Bei, Guan Yu, and Zhang Fei fought their way up the pass and took it, allowing the various coalition contingents to advance. Sun Jian and his army sprinted toward Luoyang. As they approached, they saw that the once glorious capital of the empire had been reduced to a pitiful sight. The city was still in flames. Dense plumes of smoke hung all over the city and spread for miles around. Not a living thing was left. Not a man, not a dog, not even a bird. Sun Jian first dispatched his troops to put out the fire and then sent out word for the other contingents to make camp outside the city for the time being. At this point, Cao Cao went to see Yuan Shao. The rebel Dong Zhuo has gone west, Cao Cao said. We should take this opportunity to pursue and attack his rear. Why have you not mobilized the army? Our soldiers are exhausted. There is nothing to be gained by pressing forward, Yuan Shao replied. But Dong Zhuo has burned the royal palaces and abducted the emperor. The whole empire is stunned and doesn't know what to do next. At a moment like this, one battle can settle the issue. Why do you all hesitate? But the other coalition leaders, being the generally useless lot that they are, all were against pursuing. This irritated Cao Cao to no end. It's pointless to discuss important matters with such unworthy people, he cried, and so he took matters into his own hands. He led about 10,000 men and his six generals, Xia Hu Dun, Xia Hu Yuan, Cao Ren, Cao Hong, Li Dian, and Yue Jin, and set out in hot pursuit of Dong Zhuo. Meanwhile, Dong Zhuo and his traveling cavalcade of horror were passing through the city of Xingyang. The governor of the city, Xu Rong, came out to greet them. Li Ru now cautioned Dong Zhuo. We must guard against the enemy coming after us, he said. We can have Xu Rong set an ambush by the hills outside the city. If the enemy does pursue, he can let them go by first. Then, once we have defeated the enemy, the governor can attack and cut off their retreat. That way, no one else would dare to chase us again. Dong Zhuo took this advice and ordered Lü Bu and an elite squad of soldiers to bring up the rear. Soon, Cao Cao and his army caught up to them. Lü Bu laughed and said, <laughs> it's just as Li Ru predicted. 
so Lü Bu set up his troops in battle formation and awaited Cao Cao. Cao Cao rode forward and cried out, Rebels! Abductors of the emperor! Drovers of the people! Don't you dare flee! Li Bu shot back, You traitor and coward! How dare you spout such brash words! Xia Hu Dun galloped toward Li Bu with spear in hand. The two had fought for only a few bouts when Li Jue led a force and attacked from the left flank. Cao Cao ordered Xia Hu Yuan to go fend him off, but then another force, led by Guo Si, attacked from the right flank. Cao Cao sent Cao Ren to meet them. Now under siege on three sides, Cao Cao's army could not hold its ground. Meanwhile, Xia Hu Dun started to falter against Lü Bu, and he fled back to his own line. Lü Bu then directed his armored cavalry forward, and they sent Cao Cao's army fleeing toward Xinyang. They kept running until about 9 o'clock that night, and the scattered army finally regrouped at the foot of a barren hill. The moon was as bright as the sun on this night. As Cao Cao's men were just about to prepare a meal, cries rose up from all sides. Xu Rong, who had been waiting here on Dong Zhuo's orders, sprang his ambush and unleashed his forces. Cao Cao hastily hopped on his horse and fled, but he ran smack dab into Xu Rong. Cao Cao turned and ran in the opposite direction. Xu Rong fired an arrow from behind that struck Cao Cao in his shoulder. Cao Cao didn't even bother trying to pull the arrow out and he just kept running around the hill. On the other side of the hill, however, were two of Xu Rong's soldiers lying in wait. When they saw Cao Cao's horse come near, they jumped out and stabbed the horse with their spears. The horse fell, and Cao Cao tumbled to the ground and was captured by the two soldiers. Just as things were looking dire for Cao Cao, an officer galloped onto the scene and killed the two soldiers with two swings of his knife. He then dismounted and helped Cao Cao to his feet. It was Cao Cao's cousin, Cao Hong. I'm going to die here for sure, Cao Cao told him. Brother, leave me and save yourself. No, Cao Hong replied. My lord, hurry and get on my horse. I will accompany you on foot. But what will you do if the rebels catch up to us? The empire can easily do without me, but not without you, my lord. Well, I guess Cao Cao agreed with this assessment because he took Cao Hong's horse and told him, If I make it out of this alive, it will all be thanks to you. Cao Hong then shed his armor and walked alongside the horse with his knife in hand. Around 1 a.m., they came upon a wide river that blocked their path forward. Meanwhile, the cries of their pursuers were drawing near from behind. It must be fate, Cao Cao said. I'm done for. But Cao Hong wasn't nearly as ready to give up. He helped Cao Cao off the horse, removed his armor, put Cao Cao on his back, and waded into the water. They had barely climbed onto the opposite bank when the pursuing troops arrived and started firing arrows from the other side. Cao Cao, soaking wet at this point, kept running with Cao Hong by his side. They fled on foot for another ten miles or so. By now, the sun was dawning. Seeing no one in pursuit, the two paused for a brief rest at the foot of a ridge. But suddenly, they heard men shouting and saw a squad of soldiers approach. It was Xu Rong, who had forded the river farther upstream. Once again, things were not looking good for Cao Cao. But just as he was panicking, Xia Hu Dun and Xia Hu Yuan arrived with a few dozen horsemen. Xu Rong, don't you dare harm our lord, they shouted. Xu Rong rode toward Xia Hu Dun to engage him in combat. They dueled for a few bouts before Xia Hu Dun thrusted his spear into Xu Rong and killed him. Seeing their leader slain, Xu Rong's men scattered. Soon, Cao Ren, Li Dian, and Yue Jin, each with some soldiers in tow, met up with Cao Cao. It was a sad and joyful reunion. Joyful because they had all escaped, but sad because of the more than 10,000 men they had set out with, only some 500 now remain. They gathered up the remnants of their army and headed back to the coalition camps. Having turned back Cao Cao's pursuit, and with no other coalition forces chasing him, Dong Zhuo moved on toward Chang'an with no further trouble. Meanwhile, back at Luoyang, the various coalition forces were stationed outside the city. Sun Jian, who oversaw the effort to put out the fire, stationed his army inside the city after the flames were extinguished. He set up his main base at the dynastic temple. 
He then ordered his men to clean up the debris of the ruined palace and reseal the imperial tombs that Dong Zhuo had broken into. At the dynastic temple, he built three straw huts and invited the coalition leaders to come and set up altars for the ancestors of the royal house and offer sacrifices and prayers. After this ceremony was over, everyone went about their own business and Sun Jian returned to his own camp. It was already night and the stars and the moon were shining brightly as if they were trying to outdo each other. Sun Jian sat in the open air with his hand resting on his sword and looked up at the heavens. He noticed a mist spreading over the stars of the constellation Draco. <sighs> the emperor's star is dulled, he sighed. No wonder a rebellious minister is throwing the empire into chaos while the people live on the brink and the capital is a barren wasteland. Upon this thought, tears began to swell in his eyes. Just then, one of the soldiers by his side pointed to the south and said, There's a colored beam of light coming from a well over there. Sun Jian ordered his men to light torches and dredge the well. They pulled up the body of a woman. It looked like she had been dead for a while, yet there was no sign of decomposition. She was dressed in palace attire. Around her neck was an embroidered bag. Inside the bag was a small red box with a gold lock. Sun Jian opened the box and saw a jade seal. It was square in shape, four inches on each side. On the seal were the delicate engravings of five intertwined dragons. One corner of the seal had been broken off and patched with gold. There were eight ancient characters engraved on the seal that read, With mandate from heaven, live long and prosper. Sun Jian showed the seal to his general Cheng Pu, who immediately recognized it as the imperial hereditary seal. Cheng Pu was also apparently a bit of a history nerd, because he took this opportunity to give Sun Jian a lesson on the history of the seal. So let's cue the flashback effect. The jade from which the seal was made came from the spring and autumn period. A man named Bian He saw a phoenix sitting on a rock at the foot of the Jing Mountains. He presented the rock to King Wen of the kingdom of Chu. The king split open the rock and found this piece of jade inside. So a quick aside here, there are actually many more interesting and rather gruesome details to the legend of how Bian He found the stone and presented it to the king. I think it might warrant a short supplementary episode later, so stay tuned for that. In the meantime, let's continue with Cheng Pu's flashback. In the 26th year of the Qin Dynasty, or 221 BC, a master jade cutter made a seal from this piece of jade, and Li Si, prime minister to the first emperor, engraved the characters on it. Two years later, while the first emperor was sailing on Dongting Lake, he was caught in a huge storm and his boat was about to capsize. The emperor threw the seal into the water as an offering to the gods, and the storm immediately ceased. Eight years later, when the first emperor was out inspecting his empire, he traveled through Huayin. An old man stopped him by the side of the road and handed a seal to one of his attendants, saying, This is now restored to the ancestral dragon. And then the old man vanished. And so the seal was back in the possession of the house of Qin. The next year, the first emperor died. Later, Ying, the last emperor of Qin and grandson of the first emperor, presented the seal to Liu Bang, the supreme ancestor and founder of the Han dynasty. Two hundred years later, during Wang Mang's usurpation of the throne, Empress Dowager Yuan used the seal to hit two of the rebels. In the process, she broke off a corner of the seal, and it was later repaired with gold. Liu Xiu, the founder of the Eastern Han Dynasty, came into possession of the seal at Yiyang, and has been passed from one emperor to the next since then. I've heard that during the chaos of the ten regular attendants, the eunuchs abducted the emperor and fled to Beimang Hills, and when the emperor returned to the palace, the seal had gone missing, Cheng Pu said, and now heaven has given the seal to you. My lord, 
This must mean that you are destined to rule. You should not stay here long. Let us hasten back to Jiangdong and lay out our grand design. That's what I'm thinking too, Sun Jian said. Tomorrow, I will pretend to be sick and take my leave of the other coalition leaders. Sun Jian ordered the soldiers present to keep a tight lid on this, but when you've got that many people there, somebody was bound to go off script. One of the soldiers on the scene was from Yuan Shao's hometown. Seeing an opportunity for career advancement, he sneaked out of Sun Jian's camp that night and went to see Yuan Shao and squealed about the whole thing. Yuan Shao rewarded him and kept him hidden in his camp for the time being. The next day, Sun Jian went to take his leave of Yuan Shao. I've come down with some minor illness and wish to return to Changsha, so I have come to say goodbye, he said. <laughs> I know what you're suffering from, Yuan Shao laughed. It's called the Imperial Hereditary Seal. Stunned, Sun Jian tried to play dumb. What do you mean? he asked. We have raised our forces to rid the country of rebels. The seal belongs to the court. Since you found it, you should present it publicly to the leader of the coalition so that we can return it to the court once we have killed Dong Zhuo. But now you're trying to abscond with it. What are your intentions? Why do you say that I have the seal? Where is the object you found from the well in the palace? Yuan Xiao pressed him. I don't have it. Why do you insist that I do? Bring out the seal at once, or there will be trouble for you. But Sun Jian was going to stick to his story all the way to the bitter end. He pointed to the heavens and swore an oath. If I indeed came into possession of the seal and tried to keep it for myself, may I die a violent death. The other coalition leaders now tried to intervene. If he would go so far as to take an oath like this, they said to Yuan Shao, then he must not have it. But now, after sitting back and watching Sun Jian paint himself into a corner, Yuan Shao summoned the squealer and asked Sun Jian, Was this man present when you pulled the seal out of the well? Sun Jian was infuriated and pulled out his sword to kill the soldier. Yuan Shao pulled out his sword as well and stopped him. Kill this man and you will be insulting me, Yuan Shao said. And his two top generals, Yan Liang and Wen Chou, also pulled out their swords. In response, Sun Jian's three generals, Cheng Pu, Huang Gai, and Han Dang, also pulled out their blades. Things were getting tense. The other coalition leaders now all intervened and talked the two sides off the ledge. Sun Jian then got on his horse and his army left Luoyang. Yuan Shao, however, was pretty ticked off and would not let this go. So he sent a trusted attendant with a letter to Liu Biao, the imperial protector of Jing province, and asked him to attack Sun Jian on his way home and seize the seal. We will have much more on this a little later. But first, the day after the whole brouhaha with Sun Jian, Yuan Shao received word that Cao Cao has suffered a huge defeat while pursuing Dong Zhuo. He immediately invited Cao Cao to his camp and tried to console him with a feast. After a few drinks had sufficiently lowered his inhibitions, Cao Cao began to sigh and lament. I send out my original proclamation for the good of the empire, and all you gentlemen nobly answer the call. My plan was to have our forces mount a three-prong attack that would have turned the people against Dong Zhuo and ensured victory at once. But you, sirs, have stalled out of mutual suspicion and hesitation. You have greatly disappointed the people of the empire, and I am ashamed. Well, considering every word he said was, you know, true, Yuan Shao and the other coalition leaders had no response, and the awkward feast soon broke up. Recognizing that everyone there had their own ulterior motives, Cao Cao figured that the coalition was not going to accomplish much of anything, so he led his own forces to Yang province. He wasn't the only one to hop off the bandwagon. Gong Sun Zan was having similar thoughts as well. He said to Liu Bei, Guan Yu, and Zhang Fei, Yuan Shao is useless. Things are bound to blow up here eventually. We should leave. And so they headed back toward Gong Sun Zan's base of power in the north. When they passed by Ping Yuan County, Gong Sun Zan left Liu Bei in charge of the area and then went home to replenish his army. So after all that, 
Liu Bei and his brothers were right back where they had started when this whole anti-Dong Zhuo coalition began. So now Sun Jian, who was leading the coalition vanguard, has gone home. Cao Cao, who started the coalition, has left. And Liu Bei, Guan Yu, and Zhang Fei, whose valor on the battlefield was instrumental in the success of the coalition so far, were also gone. If you get the sense that the coalition was not long for this world, you would be absolutely right. Soon after our main players left the coalition camps, things went all to hell. One of the coalition leaders, Liu Dai, asked another leader, Qiao Mao, for some provisions. Qiao Mao came up with some lame excuse and refused. In response, Liu Dai and his army staged a surprise attack on Qiao Mao's camp. They killed Qiao Mao and absorbed his forces. Seeing the coalition falling apart, Yuan Shao, the leader of the whole operation, said the heck with this, and he took his army and left Luoyang and headed back east to his own base of power. So after a whole lot of fanfare, a few stirring battles, and a ton of backstabbing, the coalition was no more. The former capital of Luoyang was in shambles, and Dong Zhuo was still firmly in power, albeit a couple hundred miles farther west. We will drop in on Chang'an and see how Dong Zhuo is doing a little later. But for now, let's turn south and check in on Sun Jian, who was on his way home. But unbeknownst to him, Yuan Shao has sent a messenger to Liu Biao, the imperial protector of Jing province, asking him to attack Sun Jian along the way. This is the first time that Liu Biao has appeared in our narrative, but he's going to play a key role later on, so let's introduce him real quick. Much like Liu Bei, Liu Biao was a distant relative of the House of Han. In his youth, he made friends with many famous people, including seven who were particularly renowned as scholars. Together, they were called the Eight Wise Ones of Jiangxia, which was a region in Jing province. I'm not going to bother naming the other seven guys, because this is another one of those cases where the novel rattles off a bunch of names that don't really matter to the narrative. What does matter to the narrative, however, is the three people who serve as Liu Biao's top advisors. One was named Kuai Liang, another was named Kuai Yue, and the third was named Cai Mao. When Liu Biao received a letter from Yuan Shao, he ordered Kuai Yue and Cai Mao to lead 10,000 men to stop Sun Jian. When Sun Jian's army approached, Kuai Yue lined up his forces for battle and rode forward. Why are you blocking my path? Sun Jian asked. You are a servant of Han. Why did you try to steal the imperial hereditary seal for yourself? Kuai Yue replied. Leave it here now, and I will let you pass. Well, Sun Jian didn't take that threat very well. He ordered Huang Gai forward. Cai Mao rode out with saber in hand to meet him. After a few bouts, Huang Gai's staff struck Cai Mao. Fortunately for Cai Mao, it struck him on the chest plate so it didn't kill him. Cai Mao turned and ran, and Sun Jian directed his army forward and they stormed through the blockade. But just then, the sound of gongs and drums echoed from the other side of the hill, and Liu Biao personally led a force out to meet Sun Jian. Sun Jian bowed to Liu Biao from his horse and asked, Sir, we are neighbors. Why do you listen to Yuan Shao and try to coerce your neighbor? You stole the imperial hereditary seal, do you intend to rebel? Liu Biao replied. If I have that object, may I die a violent death. <laughs> if you want me to believe you, then let me search your baggage train. Sun Jian was not amused by this. What abilities do you have that you dare to disrespect me so? He said as he ordered his army to attack. Liu Biao immediately fell back, and Sun Jian galloped after him. But just then... Hidden soldiers rose up from the hills on both flanks, while Cai Mao and Kuai Yue arrived from the rear with their men, and they surrounded Sun Jian. So is Sun Jian going to make it out of this alive? Find out next time on the Romance of the Three Kingdoms podcast. Thanks for listening.